أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We were discussing Surah Talaq, which is chapter 65. It has 12 verses. The major part of the Surah discusses about the rules pertaining to Talaq, the rights of women during the period of Idda, who qualifies, who doesn't qualify to be divorced. And therefore, in some hadith, this surah is also known as the smaller surah of the women, Surah to Nisa as sughra compared to the longer surah of Nisa, which is chapter 4. And the merit of this recitation of this surah, the hadith says, whosoever recites it, then will die on the sunnah of the Prophet. Man qara'a surah al-talaq ma ta'ala. Sunnati Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. If we are so careful as to read this surah, understand its meaning, apply it to our lives in the community, that means we are careful about following the sunnah in all aspects of our lives, including the difficult situation of talaq, then definitely that spirit will apply to other areas of our life where we are following the sunnah of the Prophet, insha'Allah. Ayah number one instructs the Prophet and through the Prophet the other believers who have reached a decision to proceed with talaq. But there are certain rules to be observed. Ya ayyuhan nabi, idha talaqtum nisa you have decided to go ahead with the talaq, you can't do it anytime you want. There are certain conditions to be fulfilled. Fatallikuhunna You must start at a point where the idda is valid and that is the time when you have not shared the marriage bed with them, if you have, then wait till the next menstrual cycle until she is purified, then you can pronounce your talaq, and that also when you're in your full so senses, not in a state of anger. But be careful about the calculation of the period of idda, because there are certain rules that apply during this time period, which become haram after the end of the Idda period. Wattaqullah Rabbakum. Essentially, this keeping off the waiting period of the Idda of Talaq is a law from God. The Rabb who cares for you and therefore whatever he legislates is for your good. So, لا تُخْرِجُوهُنَّ مِنْ بُيُوتِهِنَّ Don't evict them. ولا يخرجنا. Neither are they allowed to leave the marital household. إلا أن يأتينا Unless there's a sin which was committed whereby to stay together is intolerable. And these are limits prescribed by God for your benefit. You break the law and you're hurting yourself. You observe this idda period. You don't know. Even you, the Prophet, don't know. Forget about the rest of the ummah. لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يُحْدِثُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ أَمْرًا Perhaps Allah will bring about an unexpected, surprising change that whereby the process of separation has begun but not yet over at the end of the Idda period and everything is reversed and the marriage is restored. Ayah number two, فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَا أَجَلَهُنَّ And then once the Idda period reaches its end, فَأَمْسِكُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفِ أَوْ فَارِقُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفِ You have an option. Either now you retain them or you release them. Either way, be kind, respectful, considerate, polite. Don't hurt, don't harm, don't deprive them of their rights. And then the next law, which is important, and that is وَأَشْهِدُوا ذَوَيْ عَدْلٍ مِنْكُمْ You want to go ahead with the talaq or during the period of idda you want to take them back as your legal spouses you need two witnesses to testify 
the pronouncement of the talaq and later on if you decide to take them back. Two witnesses, but not ordinary people. People who possess adl, justice. In the riwayat, we, we are told what is this adl. Incidentally, there's a difference of opinion between Muslim scholars. Some of the Sunni mazhabs, they consider the requirement of the presence of two witnesses for the sake of talaq. This requirement is not wajib, and therefore the talaq is valid even if two witnesses are not there. It's mustahab, good to bring in two witnesses. But the mazhab of the Ahlul Bayt salam, unanimously requires the presence of two witnesses. If the two witnesses are absent, it's haram, the talaq is invalid. So the riwayat, they say from the sixth holy imam, for example, man talaqa bi ghayri shuhudin falaysa bi shay. You give talaq without the presence of the two required witnesses, talaq invalid. Before the sixth imam, the fifth imam also, alayhi salam, says the same, la talaqa ala sunnah wa ala tuhrin min ghayri jima'in illa bi bayyinah. Even if you want to observe the talaq of the sunnah, even if you pronounce your talaq at the time when she is pure and you have not shared the marriage bed, but there is no two witness, presence of two witnesses, invalid. In fact, before the sixth imam and the fifth imam, the original requirement was there right from the sunnah of Amirul Mu'mineen, who took it from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa who took it from the Quran, this ayah. So the fifth imam says, Qama rajulun ila Amirul Mu'mineen, a person stood up and said that uh, to Amirul Mu'mineen, Tallaqtu imra'ati lil'idda bi ghayri shuhud. I divorced, but there were no witnesses. Imam alayhi salam says, Laysa talaquka bi talaq. This talaq is invalid. The imams have explained that the reason for this requirement is what the Quran says. This is not mustahab that you must bring in to bear witness. You must invite two witnesses. This is the requirement by the Quran. So for example, one person, Abu Basir, famous companion, comes to Imam Sadiq salam, and I told him that there are some people, uh, scholars, Muslim scholars, they say, Za'ama annaka qulta la talaqa illa bibayyina. You have got your own uh, fatwa, Imam Sadiq. You've got your fatwa which says that talaq invalid if you don't have two witnesses. Imam alayhi salam replies, ma ana qultuhu. This is not my personal opinion. Balillahu tabaraka wa ta'ala yaquluh. It's God's law. It's the book of God which prescribes this. The seventh holy imam in a debate that he had with uh, one of the other scholars, Abu Yusuf Qadi, he says, uh, remember this much, inna dina laysa bi qiyas. You cannot understand the faith based on our limited logical reasoning power. You have assumed that because there is an ayah in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, which says that whenever you make a transaction, especially when you give a loan, record it, document it, and have two witnesses. The fatwa there is that إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ And we, when you make a bi'ashara, and you make a, a loan uh, lending and borrowing, bring in two witnesses that must have to do there. So therefore here also when Allah says and bring in two witnesses is mustahab. So you're comparing the two. Imam alayhi salam says, no, this is qiyas and this analogy and logical reasoning of this type in the sharia of God is not acceptable. We have to see what the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa interpreted this ayah and bring in two witnesses. Bring in better to bring or obligatory to bring, the sunnah of the Prophet was it was obligatory to bring. 
So then Imam alayhi salam explains further. In Allah Amara fi kitabihi bit talaq. God says in the case of talaq in the book of God, wa akkada fihi bishahidain that he requires two witnesses. Walam yarda bihima illa adlain. And even these two witnesses, not ordinary witnesses, but righteous, pious, just people. And then he also mentions in the book of God that marriage is recommended, marriage is good, but no requirement of witnesses. Abu Yusuf, you have flipped the religion. In the case of nikah, you have required two witnesses. In the case of talaq, you said no need for two witnesses. This is against the book of God, your fatwas. So the mazhab of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, is that requirement of two witnesses is important. But who are these two witnesses? Just like other important social, responsible duties in the Sharia, definitely the person who is a witness has to be sane, has to be um, a major, he has to be baligh, and he has to be with the right iman, and number four, he should be Adil. Adil means a person who follows the Sharia openly and does not commit haram publicly. So the riwayah Imam Baqir salam, reports from Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam, La aqbalu shahadat al fasiq. If a person is an open, public, sinful transgressor, I will not accept his testimony. He's not adil. Interesting, uh, the definition of adala, not to commit sins openly, has been elaborated in the riwayat. So the sixth holy imam says, if you have three, if you practice three things in public, then you have the right to be given four honors. Man idha haddathahum lam yakzibum thalathun. Man kunna fihi awjabat lahu arba'a. You practice these three and you qualify to deserve to be respected and honored with four. Man idha haddathahum lam yakzibum. Openly you don't speak lies. Wa idha wa'adahum lam yukhlifhum. And when you promise you fulfill. You made a contract, you made an agreement, abide by the rules of the contract. Don't renege, don't violate. And number three, وَإِذَا خَالَطَهُمْ لَمْ يَظْلِمْهُمْ And when you deal and interact with people, don't be oppressive and usurp people's rights and deny them their rights. If you practice your dealings with these three principles, then you deserve four honors. وَجَبَ And تَظْهَرَ فِي النَّاسِ عَدَالَةُ He's an adil. Openly, he's respectful of God's laws. وَتَظْهَرَ فِيهِمْ مُرُوَّةُ And he's a true human being, respectable human being. وَأَن تَحْرُمَ عَلَيْهِمْ غِيبَةُ It's haram, number three, to make his ghiba. Ghiba is allowed, ghiba is a major sin. It is only allowed for those who publicly commit sins. Everybody knows they're committing that sin. So to speak about that aib is not ghiba. And number four, وَتَجِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ أُخُوَّةُ and he must be accepted as a brother in faith and all the rights of brethren of faith will apply to him. So an adil person who, who observes the Sharia publicly, doesn't violate the Sharia publicly. Privately, well, well, we don't know what a person does at home and we're not supposed to go and spy on him or her. There's an interesting hadith which is more detailed about who is an adil. Abdullah bin Abi Ya'far says, I asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, Bima tu'raf adalatu rajul bayn al-Muslimin. What is the criteria whereby we can judge this person is adil? Adala is an important requirement. Mujtahid has to be adil. Imam al-Jama'ah has to be adil. Shahid, the witness, has to be adil. Otherwise, testimony not accepted. There are other areas where testimony doesn't require a person to be adil. But other places, somebody comes and uh, testifies 
that he, the moon was sighted. You can't accept the testimony of anyone. He has to be an adil person. So the definition and the clarification of who is an adil is important. So I, I asked Imam salam, how do we judge and assess and ascertain the adala of an individual? Imam salam says, and ta'rifuhu bisatri wal afaf. He should be well known in public that he's a self-respecting, chaste person. He doesn't openly commit sins. You can see he's controlling his, uh, his stomach, meaning he doesn't eat openly haram food. And his private parts, he doesn't engage in illegal sexual activity. And his hands, doesn't use his hands in abusive activities. والسان, he doesn't commit any sins by his tongue. Openly, you don't see him committing sins in any of this area. And he should be known in the public that he does not commit any major sin. What is a major sin? To look at a mahram with lustful intention. Sinful, but it's a minor sin. God forbid to commit an illicit sexual act with a namahram. That's a major sin. So there are some sins which are minor, some sins which are major. What's a major sin? By definition, Imam says, Allati alayha nar. Allah has promised that such an individual, if proven that he was guilty of this major sinful crime, there is Jahannam. So then Imam Ali Salam gives an example. Min shurb al khamri, wa zina, wa riba, wa uquq al walidaini, wa al firari min al zahfi, wa ghiri dhalik. So, for example, major sins like drinking alcohol. I was told that there are some people who come to the masjid, but you don't know them. Uh, they're drinking alcohol. So, say if they're doing it in private, how am I supposed to go and chase that individual person? to go find out where does he go, how does he procure his alcohol, where does he consume that alcohol. No, a public act of defiant, shameless drinking of alcohol. That's haram and publicly disrespectful. What's zina? Everybody knows, for example, people know about it, that he has been seen to engage in this sort of activity. What riba? No, he's known. You go and take a loan from him, he's going to charge interest. He's going to demand the payment of interest if you fail to pay back on time. And openly disrespectful to his parents. And he flees from the battlefield where it is wajib to attend to defend against the aggressor. And other major sins. This is a whole discussion. What are major sins? How many of them are there? Inshallah, we will discuss that uh, sometime later. Interesting. Uh, I, I will just give a quick uh, list. There are other riwayat which say major sins are seven. Some say there are 10. Some say there are 40. Uh, so sins of the tongue, for example, major sins to speak lies, to hide the truth, to sing haram songs, to degrade and humiliate a mu'min, to backbite, to gossip, to slander. Uh, uh, sexual sins like homosexuality and extramarital affairs, masturbation. Ibadat, to be sinful in ibadat, openly not to pray, openly not to fast, without any genuine excuse. Openly not to pay the wajib hukuk funds. Family sins, disrespect to and hurting parents, qat'i rahim, to cut off relation with relatives. Financial sins, giving bribes so that you can sabotage the course of justice in the court of law, to consume the rights of orphans. Financial sins like demanding interest, extravagance, gambling, hoarding, Playing, playing around with the scale when you're doing business of selling um, items which need to be weighed. Private personal sins like drinking alcohol, breaking promise, betraying a trust, 
consuming haram meat or pork or blood or practicing black magic. This, this is a list of some of the sins, be it personal, be it social, be it financial, be it in the family, be it in the body of the tongue, for example. Be it in the mind. Some sins are sinful in the mind. To be despondent and despairing of God's grace and mercy. Haram, major sin. Hasad, in such a way that it makes you commit sins. Haram and kibr, pride, in such a way that you end up degrading others. Haram and a major sin. Shirk, the greatest of all. So there's a whole list of major sins. So Imam alayhi salam then says that these sins are of two types. There is a public sin and a private sin. All his aib are hidden. In public, you can't find any aib that he openly displays. Privately, maybe yes, but, but, but it's haram to go and spy on him what he's doing at home. In public, if he has not been spotted to commit any of these haram acts, then ghibat is haram. We must respect his adala. But one important criteria has been mentioned. Amazing. And that is salah. Salah is a sign of a person who is just and righteous and pious and doesn't do zulm. وَيَكُونُ مِنْهُ التعاهد للصلوات الخمس. Regular prayers and punctual on time. إِذَا وَاضَبَ عَلَيْهِنَّ وَحَفِظَ مَوَاقِيتِهِنَّ And number three, not only is he regular, doesn't skip prayers, not only he prays on time, but he prays in jama'ah. I know, but the person is praying at home. No, sorry. Where is the public proof that he does pray? Does he attend salah? If he's missing salah without any genuine excuse, samahani, privately between you and God, Sawa, you're a good person. But in public, we cannot give you the honor to become a responsible person to be able to testify the breakdown of a marriage. No, you must come and show your participation in the congregation and la yatakhallaf an jama'atihim fi musallahum illa min illa of course you have a genuine excuse no problem you can skip the salah let's pray to Allah for tawfiq to be able to build up a community of members who have this sense of integrity and fear of God and mindfulness of God's laws and therefore respect for the human beings والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله